Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King, and I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. Today, I have a very special guest, Robert Laredin. He is the author of God's Generals, a whole series of books about great men and women of God. And he looks at why they succeeded and why they failed. Robert, it's wonderful to have you with us today. It's good to be with all of you. I'm excited to be here and uh, to be a part of the podcast. It's wonderful. So we are very thankful for your life in ministry. My wife, Jessica Shen King, she actually went to your Bible school. I remember as a student, yes. Spirit Life Bible College. And I think she arrived when she was just 17 years old. So she was very young and, and she was trained up in your ministry, learned how to pray in the Holy Spirit, learned how to uh, preach the gospel. And then she, after she graduated, she got sent out on a couple of church plants that your, your, your mm-hmm. church was sending out. And then you did Operation 500, and you sent out missionaries to Which countries all over Which was the greatest the thing I've done so far in my life. Uh, that, that part, Operation 500, is probably the most significant thing, because the Lord spoke to me, send your graduates overseas and pay for it. It's one thing to send everybody, but they have to raise their own money. But uh, we raised millions to send 500 and their families all overseas and stayed for a year. Some would stay for two, but she was a part of that, yeah. And my wife told me that she she never really felt called to missions, Mm. but she got caught up in the peer pressure. All her friends (laughs) were going to the mission field. And she said that at that time you were teaching that every Christian should at least give a year to the mission field. And, and I still believe that. Absolutely. <laughs> if the Mormons can do it, if I, we Christians can do it too, you know. Yeah. Kind of thing. And so she just got caught up in it and she got sent to India. Uh, all her friends got to go to Indonesia, which she really wanted to go to Indonesia because there was mm. a Starbucks there. Okay. But she got sent to <laughs> India. When she landed in India, she only had $20 in her pocket. And she went to your missions base, and the first thing they did, they put her on a train and said, uh, we booked you a Bible school to preach at. And she went with a friend on a train m- hours and days across India. Mm. And they got to the Bible school, and they told her, you're going to be uh, teaching three times a day for the next seven days. <laughs> and she had never preached or taught anything before. Well, how'd she do? Well, I guess she did well. So there she was. She was in India uh, with your ministry. And about six months into it, she was laying on a concrete floor, with just a thin mattress. Mm. The electricity had gone off. And so the, the fan uh, was not working. She had 60 mosquito bites on her body. Oh, Lord. And she was just thinking, if I can just get through my year of ministry, I can go back to the United States, be a worship leader at some church somewhere. (laughs) And uh, God spoke to her that night and said, Jessica, this is the life that I've called you to. And so she was excited because God had spoken to her, Mm -hmm. but also like, God, I've got mosquito bites all over. But she was obedient to the voice of God. And so she got up the next morning and she emailed her leadership at Operation 500 and said, I commit to come back for a second year. Wow. And she's been working in missions ever since. And so I actually met her on the mission field after she was with you. She went with uh, Pastor Peter Younger, great man, evangelist. Good man. Yeah. And I actually met her at one of his crusades, but I never would have met her if she hadn't obeyed the, the voice wow, of that's a, <laughs> to go to the, the mission yeah. field. My, my view then and now is uh, Bible school students, the hardest day is the day they graduate. What are we going to do? And whether most of those students I knew were not called to be in full time missionary work, but they could go for a year and start with doing that. And they'll make them a better Christian, a better American and everything. And these kind of stories I hear all the time because we had some backlash. I didn't talk, I said, I don't do it. And I said, you're going or you can leave the school. That's how strong I was. And it was the, the greatest thing I did. And it changed all their lives. And most of them came back and began to work in churches or build churches, became the missions directors of the churches. So it was exciting to see the fruit. And I should say to all the students over there watching and to your wife, when I go overseas to preach, I meet people that the students have got saved, spirit filled, healed, delivered, or kept a person in ministry they're encouraged every single time. So some of the students may not realize that they were out there working, but the fruit of it still remains. The people they got saved are still saved. The pastor is still preaching. And that's, that's exciting to see. It wasn't a waste of a year 
and a waste of millions of dollars. Well, it continues to bear fruit in my, in my wife's yeah, life for yeah. sure. So thank you. So let's talk about God's generals. You've okay. written some amazing books. Uh, let's start at the beginning. What made you be interested in studying the lives of these great men and women of God? Well, I had an encounter with Jesus that kind of started the whole thing, but then I became uh, intrigued in a very passionate way. Why did God choose this person? And then if he did, what was their call? What did they do? How did their life live? What was, if they led a revival, what happened after the revival was over? Not just the revival, but what happened to their life? And it began me on a journey to know these people. In the days I started writing and teaching God's generals, nobody cared about revival history or these people. We would know Catherine Kuhlman's name or Smith Wigglesworth's name, and they didn't care. Like today, there is a huge move of people in Christendom that want to know. But when I started writing and studying, nobody cared. The older people I would interview would cry sometimes because I was the first one who would ever ask them about what they saw, who they were with, and, and, and they would give all this uh, memory. And then they would give me stuff, pictures, artifacts, and things from the person or the revival movement. And I began a collection that by accident of all that stuff. But that's how it, it, it began. It became because the Lord told me, study the lives of my generals know why they succeed and why they will fail because there'll come a generation who'll want to know what I will show you if you'll do what I tell you to do. And so that was the opening line of that visitation. And so I did my part. Uh, study meant read books. Study meant talk to people. Study meant hunting a fact down that may take you six months to find, but you got to hunt it down. And I understood the word study because in my family, there was three of us going to school. My sister and I and my mother, she was working on her master's and her doctorate eventually. And so we were always in libraries. And so that helped me because now we do it on our phones and computers. Back then you had to go to the library, do the card catalog, go find the book. Microfish was the big new thing. And so that's where I began. And it has grown into uh, the books and the teachings around the world. Now your mother was at the, uh, the Oral Roberts University Holy Spirit Library, is that, is yeah. that right? She, she, she and my dad went there the year the university opened in 65. I was born in 66. She graduated from there and then she went back and worked at the university in the medical library during the City of Faith time period. She, uh, because she was in the LRC, the, the library, I had access to the Holy Spirit Research Center. So I would go up there and in those days I could say I touched every book in that library because I looked at it or read it. And I, they hired me to be one of the librarians in the summer because I knew more about the collection than the librarian did. So, you know, that's how detailed I was. And they would call, they would even call me after I don't, during the school year, I go back to school. They'd call me and say, no, where's this at or what story is this? And they were still using my understanding. And that's where they discovered me and began to have me teach at 15 in their seminary as a special guest on the generals. So when I was going to Oral Roberts University, I worked for the Holy Spirit Library. Oh, God and bless so this you. this was years after you. Mm. And you had donated a bunch of your material, your cassette mm. tapes, yep. to the library. And so my job, actually I was paid to do this, to listen to cassette tapes and then write up a short synopsis so that they could catalog So you did that for me? And so I did that for <laughs> hundreds of your tapes and your wow. resources. And okay. So I, even though I didn't go to your Bible school, I, I listened to a bunch wow, of Wow, that's great. Your, I didn't know teaching. that. Yeah. Wow. So let's talk about God's generals, okay. specifically in the area of evangelism. And so mm. uh, I'm an evangelist. My, my passion is telling people about Jesus. And you've looked at these through several different prisms and, and looking at why they're successful, but let's, let's focus in on the evangelistic aspect okay. of the ministries. And let's just start going down through them. Where, where would you like to start? What, well, let me just say this as an opening. Everybody in my series was a personal soul winner. So part of being a great leader, there is that aspect that they all have that. And even when they're famous, they still do that. So that I'll get that as an opening statement. So if we're going to be a great evangelist or a great Christian, we have to learn how to be a soul winner. And it's a part of our lifestyle. It's not just something we put on. It's something that we live. And that's how that was. So who would you want to talk about? I'll let you choose. Well, let's start with your, your first book. My first one. Okay. The, the, I would say these are the, the Holy Spirit empowered uh, evangelists. Yeah. And so to talk about John Alexander Dowie. What, what made him successful as an evangelist? Well, Dowie um, used healing to bring 
many souls to Christ. He was in the 1800s, uh, Australia, when the first began to happen, and there was a plague going through Australia, like the pandemic kind of thing, but a little bit more intense. And uh, a little baby was dying, a child was dying, and he was called to pray for and got healed. And that began his healing ministry. And he realized that healing brought all kinds of people to Christ, and he used that. So that would be the way that he began his salvation kind of ministry was that the healing gift came and worked. And remember back then we didn't believe in healing. Back then we didn't know if it was possible. So he was kind of the pioneer of that in a very large way. And that he brought thousands to Christ through the miracles. And that, that's what, how he did it. What about uh, Mariah Woodward Eder? Well, she's another wonderful lady uh, back when women preachers were not as acceptable as they are today. And she, um, again, had a, a, she had a tent and she traveled around central uh, parts of the central states of America and then you know, other places, but mainly the central part. And she would get up and do tent preaching, go into a town, set up the tent and start with 20 people or whatever, and then grow to a couple thousand or whatever it was. And she also um, had a unique demonstration of the spirit in her life where the Holy Spirit would hit the room and people would go into trances, both believers and non-believers. The power of God just hit them, and, uh, and then miracles too. So she was very adamant about giving altar calls that that was the first and most needful miracle in a person's life. But she had all that aspect. But she was one of those tent preachers back in the day when it was really rough and tough. What about F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth, a healing evangelist? Brother Bosworth, I mean, everyone you were speaking about has used healing. Uh, was it Raymond T. Rich, I think, said that healing is the dinner bell to salvation? And uh, so if you all understand what dinner bells are, you're on a farm, it's time for dinner, and you're out in the fields, and you hit the bell, you all come in to have dinner. And so the dinner bell to salvation was healing, when people saw the healing. And so Bosworth was very successful. He actually got healed himself. Uh, he was sick and dying and was on a train to go see his family. He goes, he thought, I'm going to be dead in just a few months. I want to see my family and gets healed. And he didn't know any other body that believed in it. And he found one of Dowie's magazines and oh, oh, there's somebody. And so he goes to Zion to see Dowie. And so long story short, he gets involved, learns the healing ministry, becomes a Pentecost, all that, and becomes very successful in his, his salvation. And again, it was back healing brought people to the Lord. And I'd have to say that it seems to be one of the most effective ways that I've seen historically uh, that salvation comes when somebody that is crippled and they saw it or they knew it and now they're not, it opens their heart, it opens their mind to accept the thought that Christ is real and I need him. And it's one of the most people, and Jesus was a healer. He was a healer and a deliverer. And, and so healing is a big part of bringing people to salvation. And Philip the evangelist, Acts chapter eight, yeah. he had miracles as part of his ministry yeah. in, in reaching the, the city in Samaria there. So I had a great conversation with T.L. Osborne about mm -hmm. how he started doing mass uh, prayer for the healing. Yeah. And before <clears throat> Dr. Osborne, he said no one was doing that. And it actually came out of a conversation that he had with F.F. Bosworth. Because uh, William Branham <clears throat> was ha holding a campaign and uh, for some reason, Branham was not able to come. So F.F. Bosworth was doing it, and he invited T.L. Osborne as a young man to come mm. and, and to participate in it with him. And so they were having a conversation, and, and, and Bosworth had this idea, what, what if we prayed for all the sick at the same time? Because yeah. at that time, I think Branham was bringing people up yeah, one, -on -one. one on one. He would lay Pray at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he was exhausted, poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, so Bosworth had the idea, he said, you know, if we, if we give a altar call for salvation, explain how Jesus saves, and then pray a prayer with them, how many of them would be saved? And Dr. Osborne said, well, all of them would, could be saved. And he says, well, if we invite all the sick up, do a mass, explain to them how Jesus can heal, and then do a mass prayer for them, how many of them can be healed? And, and so uh, they, uh, they, he planted this idea in T.L. Osborne's mind. Mm. And so then Dr. Osborne was going to Jamaica and he was doing a crusade there. And uh, they were trying to lay hands individually on each person, 
but there were just too many people. So then he had an idea. So I'm going to use Gordon Lindsay's idea and give a, a ticket to each person, yeah, a, prayer card. A, a prayer card, and he uh, gave that to the police to distribute. But a couple days later, he found out it wasn't working because the police were actually selling the cards. <laughs> so he said, that's I've not going to work. I've heard that story, work. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so then he said, I'm going to try Bosworth's idea. And so he prayed a mass prayer for the sick, and many people were healed that night. And that became his modus operandi throughout his entire ministry. And, and then Dr. Osborne, his example, has yeah, trickled down to the body of Christ. Now everybody does it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's great. I mean, Brother Bosworth wrote the great book called Christ. He had the classic book on divine healing. Everybody should read it if they don't have it. But uh, Osborne was the... To me, he was one of the greats that America did not know like they would know or Roberts, and they should have. But he spent his life in the unreached people groups of the world. And uh, his um, assistant son-in-law in those days, Jerry O'Dell, told me the story that he went into a blind school and every one of the people were healed and he brought them to the crusade and the whole town was changed. And so this is healing evangelism. And I think it's very powerful that we continue to do that. But, I always loved the story. He went to the blind school and they all were healed after he got through preaching, praying just for them, and it changed. We need that again. Amen. And it's coming again. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about Amy Simple McPherson. Oh, well, you can Great spend... Great female of Amy. You can spend hours on her. She was a soul winner uh, par excellence, and she was out to get people saved. She was a personal soul winner, and then she and her crusades that she was mainly... With again, the healing factor was the draw that brought people. And then she also used her preaching skills, her orative skills, because she says, if people are not a degree entertained, they're not gonna come back and they're not gonna listen. So she was very dramatic in the way that she would speak and teach, which brought uh, people's uh, attention. And then she trusted that what she said and the Holy Spirit would move on them. She was probably the Billy Graham of her day. Uh, of course, most people would, would know him and relate to the size crowds of America. And she went overseas a lot too, but her evangelism, she in LA, she uh, would knock on doors, send her students out to do personal evangelism door to door and things like, like that. Yeah. Now, I, I remember sitting in some of your classes on God's Generals and, and you talked about Angela's temple, mm. which she built and she did very elaborate production sometimes. They call them illustrated what were, sermons. What were some of those illustrated sermons? She would do illustrated sermons on Sunday nights and Hollywood would come to see what new things she was doing so they could put it into the new industry called film or movies. And so she would do like, for example, she would do Jonah and the whale. So they created a big whale and she'd dress up like Jonah and walk out of the mouth of the whale into the stage. Uh, she would do Noah's Ark. And this is a funny one. She brought, she, she knew the zookeeper of LA. So she had some of the animals from the zoo come in and was a part of the stage set, live animals, and a parrot began to cuss right in the middle of her sermon. And so she turns around and tries to convert the parrot from being a bad cussing person. The crowd loved it. So she did things like that. She also had special days like uh, the war started happening, World War II. She'd have military day and all the soldiers would come and they'd feed them and love them and talk to them. So she did specialized preaching for specialized groups. And so she, that's how she'd do it. You have a book which you call The Revivalist, mm -hmm. and it deals with uh, D.L. Moody, uh, Billy Graham, Finney, and some of the other yeah. uh, earlier evangelists. Yeah. And uh, the name of the book, you have it subtitled The Revivalist. And so I was, I've wondered why did you name it The Revivalist instead of The Evangelist. Uh, Finney talked a lot about revival, mm -hmm. but uh, Billy Graham probably wouldn't call himself a revivalist. He probably would have said, I'm an evangelist. Yep, that's what they were, where they called themselves that or not. That's why I called it. So the, these guys you just mentioned did not work in healing like the group we just talked about. Yeah. So when you study church history and revival history, you've got two powerful groups. You've got those who believe in what we call in healing evangelism which is more the scriptural way of how things are done with Christ and the apostles, healings that brought people to the church or to Christ. Uh, they were many just a salvation preacher. They came and just preached the cross and your commitment to him. And it worked, there was an anointing for that. That was Billy Graham. Uh, but these were all different characters. Uh, D.L. Moody is one of my favorite in the book because he, he was not really a guy that should have made it. 
He was called a country bumpkin. He was, he talked funny. He was probably dyslexic in some ways because the reason why they call him the greatest layman, because he never would allow himself to be ordained because he couldn't pass the catechism or the, the membership course to get in. And so he said, if I can't pass it, then I'm not going to take it. So he, he never really was ordained. But never he, a real preacher. Never a real preacher. But he was but one of them. Tremendous he preached, I think, to 100 million people before he died. Wow. Billy Graham preached to 215 million before he died. I don't know. How that includes him in person. That doesn't include the TV world. And there were fewer people back then than there yeah. are today. So, so. You, you know, D.L. Moody died in 1899. And he preached to that many in the 1800s in person. So that's a lot of work and big campaigns. One night he was preaching in, in Chicago where he was living and uh, a child and a man got saved. There's only two people who got saved that night. And so he was still left in the building and the janitor was sweeping. And so they started talking and he goes, I'm really disappointed. I only got, you know, two people, you know, saved. And the, the, the guy, um, the, the janitor said, no, you got one and a half. He said, oh, I guess you, the child was the half. He goes, no, it's the other way around. That guy's already half dead. That's a whole life there. And that changed his view to even child evangelism. And I think there's a need for that in our discussion and in our life today of child evangelism. Uh, things catered to the children at their age of understanding so they can come to Christ while they're still young. And he was a part of that and, and doing that early in his ministry. What about Jonathan Edwards? Well, he was uh, the, the first great awakening. He was, a, he was an intellectual um, that did not resist or oppose the work of the spirit. Many intellectuals, because they're academically sharp, they have a hard time relating to the manifestation or the work of the spirit. He defended it. And so he was a, a man that God used. He, actually, his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, was an accidental moment. He had preached that sermon Sunday before and nobody reacted. It was just like, oh, whatever. So he goes out to a minister's gathering or another church and they ask him to preach. And I don't think he was scheduled, but he had his notes from that sermon in his little horse satchel and pulled it out and began to preach it. And as he began to preach, they began to wail and cry and grab hold of the post because they thought they were dying and going to hell. And it helped birth that second wave of the great awakening. And thousands came to the Lord. Um, George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, that early era, helped America become Christian. George Whitfield was the Billy Graham of the colonial era. He was more popular than the founding fathers. And many of the things that he said in his sermons, the founding fathers papers would quote him or say it like the phrase we have on our money, one nation under God. George Whitfield would get up and preach 10, 20, sometimes 30,000 people. And he'd always declare that this is one nation under God. And it becomes the slogan on our money. And in many of our national documents, it came from a revivalist preacher who said, this shall be, and it became that and became our slogan. But those two guys helped America become Christian. And uh, in that moment with Whitfield, uh, he carved out in the American conscience that we want a righteous Christian evangelist next to the president. Those two have always been, now you can see it in our day, the person that sent that off was Billy Graham. You can go back and you can see Billy Sunday. There are generations who didn't have that guy. But when we did, it was a better country. But there was that place that right next to the president, we want that man or woman of God. And, and uh, we need to pray that it gets filled in this time. I love the story about uh, ben, Benjamin Franklin, who mm. was friends with George Whitfield, although Ben Franklin never necessarily <clears throat> became a, a believer. Uh, but uh, he knew that Whitfield was good at receiving an offering. And so yep. there's a story about how he uh, <laughs> went to hear him preach, but he left his purse at home because he says, I'm not giving in the <laughs> offering. And George Whitfield did such a good job uh, asking people to give towards an orphanage that he had to turn to the person next to him and borrow money to put in the offering. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that, that's true. Ben Franklin and them were friends. The reason why we have George Whitfield's sermons is because Ben Franklin printed them in the newspaper. And that's where we got them today because if not, they'd have been lost to history. Okay, Francis Asbury, is he in one of your books? Yeah, he's in the revivalist book. Asbury was uh, one of the most significant men in American history. 
Uh, he was the head of the Methodist revival movement here and the revival of the, the Methodist church. Uh, he rode horses everywhere. He was at days of the circuit rider preachers. And he would go and teach to somebody's house where that has three people. He might have a, another meeting of 25 people. You don't have what you call the large crowd, but you have his consistently working the fields of harvest, which is a different kind of evangelism and ministry. Now he did have some, but not on the scale of Whitfield or Edwards, but he was significant in making sure the gospel went as America began to go west, it had to go. And he was a part of, of doing that. Charles Finney. Well, you could talk about him all day long. He's, he's called the father of American evangelism or revivalism. Uh, he came along at a time when we have a doctrinal problem. Calvinistic belief that some have been chosen to be saved and others are not. So if you weren't chosen by God to be saved, there's no hope for you, but you don't know. So you have to live the Christian life just in case you were chosen. So stupid. And so um, that's kind of, I've simplified it. That's kind of what they believe. Finney comes along. He was a lawyer who gotten saved and he had that lawyer mind. So he would preach to make the case. And so he came along and said, it's not that God won't save you. It's if you won't choose it. So it's your will versus God's will. So he broke the back of that feeling. Now, let me explain it this way. If you were told your whole life, Daniel, you can never go to heaven. God didn't choose you. And that's what the preacher said. And you accepted that and you didn't want to be lost. You wanted to be a part of God's family, but for some reason you weren't good enough. And then here comes Finney and says, that's not true. It's available to every man if you will choose it, if you will accept it. When that happened, all those who had been rejected got it and they held it dear. That's why 85% of his converts stayed true to their conviction of salvation through their life. That's better than Billy Graham and Or Roberts combined together. And, and Charles Finney would have, one of the secrets of his evangelism and revivalism was a guy named Father Nash, his prayer warrior. And he would go into a town or an area and pray. And then when he felt like it broke it though, he would send a notice, it's time to come and Charles would come and have the, the revival meetings. So a part of our mass evangelism has to be that prayer work in the spirit done before. So I hope that our evangelists that are watching realize, you know, we can organize it, we can plan it, we can advertise it, it's all great, but don't forget the spiritual work that's required, more so than some of the natural. Yeah, I like what? Reinhard Bonnke said, you need prayer and evangelism. They're like two legs. Mm. You pray and then you evangelize. You pray and then you evangelize. If you're only doing one or the other, it's like hopping on one leg, yep. you won't go anywhere. It's true. What about uh, William Booth, the great uh, Salvation, Salvation Army. Army? Out of all the revival movements that I would like to have been part of, it would have been that one. And I'm a Pentecostal, so people go, oh. But William and Catherine Booth, the Salvation Army in the eight, middle 18th century, amazing. Um, they were, well, he, they met and dated through letters, him and his wife, Catherine, and she was sickly. So she stayed home most of her childhood and would do school from home and read lots of Christian books, Finney books, Puritan, early church, Puritan fathers, and became very astute in those ways. They get married and uh, they get kicked out of the Methodist church because they, <laughs> you love them, because they kept bringing the wrong kind of people to church. Now, in those days, you bought your pew, like the Smiths bought this pew, the Jones bought this, so you had your pew. And so the pastor was telling them, well, bring some more people to church, you wanna grow it. And so they begin to bring the drunks, the hookers, I mean, to church and, and put on their robe. Well, these people didn't know how to be in church. So they would drink or eat and they'd say to the one guy said, the pastor, can you say that again? Freaked out the whole church. So they were told by the pastor eventually, quit bringing these kind of people to church. And uh, that's not the kind that we want. And it so offended them that they you know, left and began to do other things outside the structure and ended up in a tent meet in East London that turned into the Salvation Army. And a Salvationist was one that went after souls first and utmost. And uh, William Booth believed in healing, but he, he wrote a book on faith healing. So a rare book, but he wrote one. And because one of his kids was in Zion with Dowie. So he knew about all that. He said, I, I'm not again, he, the book I read of his, he's for it, believes in it, he goes, but I'm not gonna do anything to overshadow the preaching of salvation. That's why he viewed it. 
and he changed the world uh, by the gospel. The reason why people are a little odd with him is because he had social justice and salvation combined together. Uh, for example, the reason why we have a 10 o'clock break in our work and an afternoon, we call them tea breaks in England, was because of him in the army. He saw people that were working 8, 10, 12 hours without a break. Said, That's not right. So he began to fight and change the law. Then he noticed the little kids were working, you know, little 8, 9, 10 years at the same time in bad conditions. Got the child labor laws that we obey today it comes from Salvation Army. So you have that aspect of it. He believed if a man's stomach was empty, he can't hear the gospel. Give him a sandwich and then he'll get saved. And so that was one of his philosophies. His other one was, when you go to a town, find the worst sinner and get them saved first and all the rest will come in. And that's really how it worked. I think merging social justice with evangelism would really appeal to today's generation, yep. which is very concerned about many social justice issues. The only thing with that is you cannot let social justice take first place. The gospel is first and social justice is second. And so I, 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 I'll say it this way. I see how the enemy can flip that to where the enemy still stays in charge of controlling people's lives. We feed them, we help them, but we don't put the gospel first. So we need to be careful that as we do social justice that it stays second to the salvation of the soul. Let's talk about some of the people that you knew personally. Uh, what was it that made men of God like uh, Lester Summerall or Roberts so effective in their ministries? Well, one, they, they knew that was what they were called to do and they had a surety about it. If you don't have an absolute surety of who you are, then you will never rise to that, what I call the big platform. You'll rise to some other platform. It would be nice, but the surety. Or Roberts and Brother Summerall both knew who they were, what they were called to do. Now, they were called differently, but they had the same surety about that. And I don't see that as strong in our generation. We have a lot, of, oh, I want to be a preacher. Like, no, I, I get it, but there has to come that absolute surety. One is that they were also people that um, went for the whole world. Or Roberts was an evangelist. Summer Rob was more of an apostle. He built churches and did evangelism, but he did more things than Brother Roberts. Or Roberts became the more popular one because of his evangelism. But he went after it and uh, he knew it was there. He trusted God and they all knew how to fight the devil, which a lot of times we don't talk about. But if you don't fight him, he will take over or begin to influence. So you have to always be on a war footing against darkness. You've studied the sweep of church history and seen evangelism in the lives of all of these great men and women mm. of God, their, their techniques, how they minister to people and how they delivered the gospel. And what do you think God wants to do in today's time? Look, looking at the sweep mm. of history and, yeah. and how God has moved evangelistically and yeah. brought people into the kingdom over history, bring that into today. What, what do you think God wants to do well, today? Well, I think we, we have to learn how to evangelize in a highly developed modern culture, which we've not done too well. We're good with one-on-one uh, food and bring them to the gospel, the big crusades like you do in parts of the world. The crusades like that don't work here in the States. I mean, you can do them, but you don't get the same result. And they're super expensive. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> so I think there's a shift coming. I call it people group missionaries, people group evangelism. I see that today's world, America has become a mission field. Uh, in my lifetime, we've gone from a Christian nation to a nation that needs missionaries sent to her. So let the Africans come, let the Koreans come, let the people come to help us. But we're gonna have to know how to evangelize. Yeah, God told me the mission field shall become a mission force. Yes, we and come, come help us in America. Yeah, we need we, your help. We sowed our young men and women, now it's time to reap, so come. And, and when they come here, like Africans, when you come here, don't become American, pray like an African. Move like, we need that fire kind of thing. But people group missionary is this. I think the same way that you're called to the field like you are, there are people in America, in churches, who may not be called to India, but they're called to a people group in our society here. For example, there's the Red Hat Lady Society. 
there are unwed mothers, there's single fathers, there's all kinds of people groups. There's the tattoo people, there's the trans people today. We got all kinds of people groups. And the same way we receive calls to go to the nations, I believe the call to go to a people group is going to be the thing we'll see rise in the highly developed modern cultures. And that way evangelism is done by everybody and everybody has a significant type of placement. Now, when you, does, it, does that make sense? The people, group, now you have to realize too folks, there are groups that have a taboo attached to them. Things that they do that will make the church go, hmm. Now church, everybody Christ died for. The taboo weirdos and the normal people, he died for all of them. Everybody has a right to hear the gospel. Do not come against people who God calls to go to the gay community or the trans community or the drug community where there's taboo. Sometimes I've seen people go into these groups and, well, what are you doing when you're agreeing with them? You, you can't expect a harvest until a seed is sown. And you have to have enough guts to walk across these lines that have stigma and taboo attached to them so they can get saved, like the gay community. You know, why is it so hostile? Well, probably because the Jerry Falwell generation understood what was happening, that this was going on, and they didn't stay on their knees long enough to find a strategy to help them get saved. All they did was damn them and condemn them, and we have this hostility. And that's why it's dark in that community, and why there's a resistance to the gospel because of how it was done in the 70s and so forth. It was, it was overreaction without the compassion and the strategy of God to bring hope, salvation, and healing. And so uh, the, when you walk across that line, the church should encourage you. The church should support you. If that's your people group that you're called to, you have to allow some people groups move faster toward the gospel. Others are slow, just like on the mission field. So you have to give people room and not persecute them. My joke is you need two shields of faith. If you go to people group with taboo, you need one in front and you need one behind because the church will keep from behind and the folks will keep from the front. So you can go through, but I think that's what's coming. I already see it happening, but we need to preach it more. And we cannot be afraid to be a missionary to a people group that has a taboo. Until someone sows the gospel seed, there never can be a harvest. And they keep getting darker because people won't cross that border. For example, if you go to New Guinea and preach to the naked people, nobody in America gets mad at you about that. They'll give you more money and go, go for it. And, and, but you go to a people group with a cultural taboo and they'll almost kill you. It should be the same attitude from the New Guinea for these people. And so um, the enemy is going to try to keep that stirred up so that we won't go there. But I always look for the people who are going to the rough folks in our society and encourage them and support them because they're doing evangelism in these first class nations. The reason why, like Africa, like Nigeria, there's a great revival there today. One reason why everybody goes because they have nothing else to do. I mean, part of the problem with our Western culture is we have so many distractions and so many stuff going on and our little phones and everything. Some of the people in these parts of the world, they don't have that. So the crusades and things work because I can't go to a movie. There's no movie house here. Let's go see sure. Daniel. And so not I'm belinda, I understand there's a difference. So when we come into this culture, we're gonna to have to learn how to, to deal with media and what I call the people group missionaries. Yeah, everyone's spending time on TikTok and Facebook yeah. and so you gotta go where they are at. Yeah. I can see a day and I don't like anything that I'm about to say. So everybody understand this, is I see the day coming when church will be online and people will come to special events in the West because they're so busy and they don't want to, they can watch it online. Now, I don't like that. I want you together. I want you to be there in person. But if that's what's coming, we need to get in front of this and make sure that our media is sharp, it's together, it's organized so we can capture those people. So what advice would you give to evangelists that are wondering how to succeed and how to avoid failing? One thing, don't forget to preach the cross in Jesus in all your preaching. It's amazing how well, you start out preaching the simple gospel message and then, and myself included in this, pretty soon you're preaching everything else but that. And that's what that message is a power to salvation. And don't forget to preach the gospel in all your preaching is one of the big things. Because then you'll lose the soul saving and the miracles won't be. He confirms his word with signs following. And that's miracles and that's also salvation. So that'd be one. Two, always have a follow-up plan. 
when you have a baby, you can't just leave it on the curb. It'll die. So we have to have an attitude, and God will have different ways of doing it with different people. There's not just one method, but a follow-up program or a placement program for those that get saved. Now, sometimes in your big crusades, it's probably a little more challenging to take care of, but at least the effort is made. And uh, see, Africa should have been saved a long time ago. As many of these crusades have gone there from you know, the 50s. And many uh, of the nations in Africa actually have a higher percentage of Christians than here in America. Yeah, yeah, and they're actually and, great. But, yeah. but the thing is, the discipleship of the Christian life yeah. was, was weak in, in years. But today in Africa, a new thing is the great church is now alongside the great crusade. And that didn't happen. I was in Nigeria back when I was in my 30s. And the Lord said, you'll not come back to Africa until the church is as big as the crusade. Well, I didn't know. I thought, I'm never going back to Africa. So um, I went back about four or five years ago to Nigeria and to Ghana, and I saw churches as big as a crusade. I preached in a church that has 100,000 seats in it. That's a big deal. A church, a building. But that's not the biggest church in Nigeria. That's just the biggest building. The Redeemed Church, about two million people or so. Yeah, I've been to their church building. It's bigger than a football field. It just goes on and on and on. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So you see that, and this to me is exciting because now when people get saved, they're going to be discipled in those churches. And that was a weakness years ago, even in the Osborne era. They didn't have strong churches. In those, they did the Crusades, people got saved, but the, the, the growth of the gospel or the steadiness of the gospel wasn't as strong as it is today, which is a great sign. Well, Brother Roberts, thank you for being on the Evangelism Podcast. Loved it. It's so wonderful to get your insights into these great men and women of God. And I'd encourage you, go get the God's Generals books by Roberts Lairdon. It will be a tremendous blessing to you, and Good. you'll learn so much more about these great men and women of thank God. You. Thank you for having me, Daniel, and tell your wife a big hello for me. Thank you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.